you know, first, I want to really mention here that obviously I'm, I'm not really sure of uh, everybody's background there, you know, in the audience. But one thing I want to really mention, I, I use the word really generic uh, of addiction professional, obviously, uh, a lot of people who work, who see patients, in fact, who in addiction, uh, who see patients who have addiction problems, you know, usually they see them in different settings. So you either see them in medical setting, you see them in social services setting, you see them in psychiatric setting. So uh, the scope of practice obviously varies a lot with education, training, and state requirements. And uh, I'm going to really more generalize the term to really talk about generically a practitioner because obviously it is different when you are really a physician prescribing okay. versus somebody who is a therapist, a social worker, and or a case manager or a peer navigator. So uh, these different backgrounds can really obviously require different educational background as well as really training. And obviously, the one thing that I want to really discuss here in our uh, presentation is that uh, uh, all these principles that we will be discussing about uh, treatment approaches and uh, would definitely be applied in uh, different contexts. And I'm not talking about really just psychiatric settings where we see patients who have also substance use disorders, but also in addiction settings where we see patients who have also psychiatric disorders, or even in other really settings, medical settings like emergency room settings or primary care settings, or even ob gyn settings, you know, or even social services settings. Next slide. So th this is really, the, the, as I mentioned earlier to you, that I want to present some basic uh, uh, information here and to put it really into the context of addiction practice, particularly the, for us, I'm an addiction psychiatrist who do a lot of the work in addiction settings and as well as also collaborating with other uh, medical settings. The, the one thing that we know very well that, and I mentioned it here as a, uh, putting in the title, the personal experience as well as science and practice, how we can blend all these aspects. The bottom line is that we know that very well. We know that there's more than one path to recovery, which means that there are, we see a lot of patients in uh, our practice who basically recover, uh, as we say, naturally, that uh, they make a decision to pursue some sort of a changes and they quit using substances. We see people who need a lot of professional help. In fact, we see also a lot of people who rely just on, for example, support groups, you know, such as the 12-step programs. We need to keep in mind as practitioners for us to understand how our own personal perspectives, particularly I'm referring here to people who work in the field of addiction, and who are themselves in recovery. And uh, uh, these people can have different perspectives based on their own personal experiences, and they might at some point in time share these perspectives with their patients or clients. And uh, we need to keep in mind that we need to be extremely careful about not attempting to impose any sort of uh, uh, opinions or any sort of really options based on personal experiences. In fact, uh, we have to be always open-minded and discuss with patients all potential treatment options, and obviously sharing personal experiences are important, uh, but I can tell you one thing from the research. The, the, the basic fact that somebody who's in recovery, uh, the, you know, uh, himself or herself, is going to have an impact necessarily on uh, 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 the patient. Uh, patient's outcome when it comes to recovery has not been demonstrated. What we know very well, sharing personal experiences about what people have done themselves to help them with the recovery, it could be potentially helpful, but you don't want to impose what your perspectives are. And, uh, and we need to be always keep very open-minded about what treatment options exist. And, in, and, and, uh, and there are some patients who might benefit from some particular options versus others and that who would benefit from another option, and we need to keep that in mind. And, and I will discuss it a little bit later when I talk about the patient treatment matching. When it comes to science, and this is what I want to mention here very importantly, is that when we're practicing, we're practicing applying evidence-based and scientific uh, 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 data that we have. The issue is that, uh, and we've had that struggle in the field of addiction particularly, is how to translate scientific data into practice. Uh, 
and it has been a big challenge of transferring really what we know in research and putting it into practice. And it, it, it really, uh, I'm going to give you one example. For example, we, uh, we uh, you know, with the buprenorphine treatment in primary care settings. We know that this is a treatment that works really very well for people who have opioid use disorders. We've been experiencing significant obstacles to really translate and disseminate and adopt buprenorphine treatment into primary care settings for different reasons. So yes, we have a great uh, uh, treatment approach that has been scientifically founded. At the same time, to putting it into practice has become extremely, has become or has been, you know, very, very much challenging. And when we come to really also practicing based on what we know from the science, we have to always keep in mind that we want to practice with, as I call it, informed caution and humility. So yes, we have clinical studies that have showed that some treatment works for, for patients. It does not mean that they're going to work for every patient we're going to see, which means that all these clinical trials findings and outcomes might not be generalizable to really a, a, a community practice. So we need to keep that in mind. And I mentioned here on that slide also that when it comes to working with patients, we have to always think about it as from a person and patient-centered collaborative approach. This is the approach where we work with patients. We don't work on patients. And throughout that working relationship, we definitely discuss with the patients what we know scientifically. At the same time, we can discuss our experience what we have really seen as a part of the work we've done and what works for most patients. And also, as I mentioned earlier, sharing some perspective, if there is any personal perspective, that could be helpful without imposing it. And so obviously the combination of three, these three aspects and blending them together and having some sort of a balance there and always remembering that it's entirely up to the patient to eventually decide what treatment option would work best for them and we can guide them through the process by giving them a menu of options and describing every option and letting them make this informed decision based on what they've heard from us. Next slide, please. So now, in terms of the defining the co-occurring disorders, I'm going to uh, uh, mention here that uh, a lot of the studies that we have are really old studies when you look back. They are epidemiological studies as well as clinical studies studies, so samples of clinical studies. This is one of the huge uh, uh, studies that has been uh, done in the field, and it looked at basically the comorbidity of substance use as well as psychiatric disorders among a sample of about 10,000 adults. Just to give you some sense here that 13.5% uh, uh, had an alcohol use disorder of those, 36.6% also had a psychiatric disorder. Here I will be more specific later on. But when we talk about psychiatric disorder, we're talking about really obviously the whole range of the DSM psychiatric disorders, you know, talk about depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, personality disorders, and uh, psychotic disorders. Uh, among that sample of about 10,000 individuals, adults, uh, drug use, uh, there's six one point percent had a drug use disorders, and look at basically the higher, almost one out of two people who have a drug use disorders have a psychiatric disorder. So in any sort of a practice, you're going to see somebody with a drug use disorder, you know, the likelihood chance that they're going to be having, what's called the odds ratio, that they're going to be having a psychiatric disorder is 0.5. And 22.5% of that sample of 10,000 adults had a psychiatric disorder. Now flip it, you know, these are the patients who have the, 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 the psychiatric disorder Almost one third, like 28 to 30 percent, had an alcohol or drug use disorders. So, if we see all these odds ratio that go from 2.3 to 4.5, whichever way you want to look at it, every patient who's going to walk through the door, who presents with whether psychiatric disorder or a substance use disorder, you want to always think that there is at least one third to half of a chance that they're going to have another disorder. So if they have a substance use disorders, they're going to have another really, the odds of having a psychiatric disorder is going to be high, and the vice versa. If they're going to walk in with a psychiatric disorder, presenting with a psychiatric disorder, the odds of having a substance use disorder is also high. Next slide, please, slide. Okay. Well, this is, I want to really show you this uh, before I, we move on and continue with the co-occurring disorders. Because this is really, this is a very 
uh, in a sense, very classic study that looked at uh, also understanding, you know, the uh, models of helping and coping that are applied to uh, addictive disorders. And uh, as most of you know who work in the field of addiction about all the models of, uh, uh, of substance use disorders, of addictions, and I'm going to start with the moral model. And on one, uh, above the moral model, I mentioned whether the person is responsible for changing addictive behaviors, yes or no. And on the left side, of your screen is, is the person responsible for the development of the addictive disorder, yes or no? In the moral model, which as you know that has been culminated in the war on drugs that became a total fiasco and then and we end up basically abandoning it, is the moral model really kind of in a sense uh, identifies people that are, they are responsible for changing addictive behavior at the same time they are responsible for the development of the addictive behavior. And in fact when people go back to using, the relapse is seen as a crime or a lack of willpower. When it comes to the disease model, you know, is that with the disease model, the, 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 the idea was that no, the person is not responsible for changing addictive behavior, and the person is not in fact responsible for the development of addictive behavior. And how it was really perceived was that in the disease model, which include the heredity and the physiology, the biology aspect, is that when people go back to using, it's a reactivation of a progressive disease that is basically not going to get better, it's going to get, in fact, worse. If we look at the spiritual model, which is the 12-step model, which is not exactly the disease model, even though there are a lot of people within the 12-step uh, programs that have really disseminated that the teachings of Bill W. were uh, uh, indicating that the, the addiction is a disease, which is not really true because the, the definition is much better really conceptualized as really an illness with multiple components to it, is that in the spiritual model, which is really does not hold the person, in fact, responsible for the changing the behavior, but they hold them responsible for the development of the addictive behavior, is that if people go back to using, it is seen as being disconnected from the higher power, or they have lost, they are really, you know, uh, they made some sort of a sin in a way. It's like not, not see, it's seen as more because of the disconnection and the loss of the contact with the higher power. The model that has been moving more and then being more embraced, that, that is really the compensatory model that has been originally uh, conceptualized by Alan Marlett, which really look at that the person is responsible for changing addictive behavior. Once people are addicted, they have responsibility and a choice whether they want to continue using or changing their behaviors or not, but they are not, these people are not really to blame for the development of the addictive behavior. I want you to keep that in mind, you know, because this is going to really determine a lot what sort of a treatment we're going to be providing even for people who have the co-occurring disorders. Next slide, please. So going back to really what I've started with discussing with the co-occurring disorders, and uh, I mentioned about the odds of uh, having a, uh, a high odds of having a psychiatric disorder in addiction treatment, people who present with substance use disorders. And take a look here at the, the highest really, uh, uh, in a way, percentages and the highest, basically, the, the disorders that have the highest comorbidity include, first, the mood disorder, which is really, I want to point out, particularly not just major depressive disorder, but bipolar disorder. The bipolar disorder has very, very high comorbidity with substance use disorders. And I'm referring to particularly substance use disorders, the alcohol, cocaine, disorders. And uh, anxiety disorder comes next if you see the percentages there that are really very high. And here I want to mention separately a little bit also the PTSD because the PTSD by itself is extremely comorbid with particular uh, 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 substance use disorders, particularly alcohol, also stimulant as well as also opioids. The two major personality disorders that are the cluster B personality disorder are associated with the co-occurring, you know, within the context of substance use disorders and they make most of the co-occurring disorder when it comes to the personality disorders is the antisocial personality disorder and borderline personality disorders. They are really, in a, in a sense, at equivalent kind of rates in terms of prevalence. The other one is that the thought disorders, which is the schizophrenia, the schizophrenia is associated, we see high, particularly high prevalence of schizophrenia with the cannabis use disorder. It doesn't mean if they are, the prevalence is much lower than what you see with mood disorder, anxiety disorder, that you don't see a lot of also 
people who struggle with schizophrenia who use substances but not necessarily having a full-blown substance use disorder. So, for example, if you have a patient who has schizophrenia and use cannabis, even if it's not at severe levels, the use of cannabis could by itself affect the course of the schizophrenia and could also affect the course of treatment. People can be less resistant, in fact, sorry, people can be more resistant to treatment if they are actively using any substances, particularly cannabis, even though if they are using it not at really levels where it is considered as a full-blown addictive addiction, which means, you know, full-blown substance, the severe substance use disorders. Next slide, Jess, please. All right. So, uh, as I mentioned, just to define here a little bit, putting it into context, so uh, roughly you have to think, in the context of addiction treatment, roughly half of the population will have another psychiatric disorder, which means that every patient who walks through the door of an addiction treatment program, always remember that 50% of these patients that are gonna walk in, one out of two of them, are gonna have some sort of a psychiatric disorder. In mental health services, in psychiatric settings, SUDs, substance use disorders, are the second most common diagnosis in the general population and the most frequent co-occurring disorder among people with serious psychiatric illness. When I'm referring to the serious psychiatric illness, I'm talking about the severely, persistently mentally ill. And we need to keep that in mind. You know, and, uh, the, and always remembering that the co-occurring disorder is always an expectation, not an exception. And I will talk about a little bit later about the treatments later on. There is, there is very good news here. Effective treatment of the substance use can also improve the course of the co-occurring disorder. And obviously, when we talk about treatment, I'm gonna discuss more and more later on the integrated treatment. There's always the question when we discuss the co-occurring disorders is that what comes first? Well, that's been debated for years in the field of addiction. Uh, the chicken or the egg question, and I'll be very honest with you, the, 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 this whole thing, it didn't get us anywhere. You know, in terms of trying to really, we, we tried to define before, is this a primary diagnosis, is this a secondary diagnosis, which one came first? Uh, could it be that somebody was self-medicating and they started out with being depressed and they become, start having a, a, an alcohol use disorder? Well, first of all, the, these kind of theories, which one came first, do not really hold at all because what really matters ultimately is that once you have the two conditions together, they're gonna to be linked together, they're gonna to be very intertwined, and you would have to address both of them simultaneously, and I'll talk about the integrated treatment, which means uh, the debate about which one really came first is not gonna make any much of a difference when it comes to uh, really providing treatment and the impact on outcome. Next slide, please. So the three things that we need to keep in mind when there is a co-occurring disorder, and the combination of the two disorders is usually more serious than either disorder alone, which means that when we're talking about is that people struggle more significantly when they have two disorders. And even sometimes we have patients that we see in our practice that have three disorders even, not just really two disorders. And they could have like two psychiatric disorders and one substance use disorder, or two substance use disorders and one psychiatric disorder. And let's keep in mind here, and the point I wanna make that is extremely important in the context of uh, addiction and people who struggle with using substances, across uh, really addiction treatment, the people that we see who use one substance most of the time, at least 50 to 70% of them use another substance. So the polysubstance use is the norm. The polysubstance use is norm. It would, which really complicates treatment. And as you can imagine, if you have somebody with uh, 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 alcohol and cocaine use disorders on top of the fact that they have also schizophrenia, you can imagine also how the treatment would become more and more complicated. When the two disorders co-occur, the course of each problem area is worsened, which means the substance use disorder can make the psychiatric disorder much worse when it comes to really the course of treatment and even the course of the problem. It's the course of the illness as well as the treatment and vice versa too. And a lot of people who have obviously co-occurring disorders, they uh, tend to really have uh, uh, much more impairment in terms of their functioning, 
uh, impairment in terms of a psychosocial impairment, in terms of uh, uh, functioning impairment, and also they have a greater uh, 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 negative uh, impact, negative impact on the quality of life. Next slide, Jess, please. So the question now, what the, you know, what the, the, we always go ask ourselves also, why the high comorbidity? How come that we see these two disorders happening very often and very frequently? And how can we basically understand that uh, the high comorbidity? What, uh, what are the theories that have been basically uh, articulated to really kind of uh, 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 describe uh, uh, the, the, the comorbidity itself. Uh, there are a lot of basically theories, there are a lot of models that have been looked at, and one of the, I'm going to put them in two, uh, two separate models, uh, major models. First of all is what we call the secondary substance abuse, substance use disorders model. So what this model is, uh, you know, that the comorbidity, the fact that we have high comorbidity, is due or could be due to mental disorders, psychiatric disorders, causing, causing some cases of substance use disorders in vulnerable individuals. For example, you know, one of them is that, uh, 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 you know, that I want to discuss here is the self-medication hypothesis. Self-medication hypothesis reports that people who have psychiatric disorders, they use substances to self-medicate to ameliorate the symptoms of their psychiatric problems. Well, in general, Really, the evidence supporting the self-medication hypothesis is weak for most psychiatric disorders. In fact, one of the psychiatric disorders that is really more, uh, that has a stronger, somewhat a stronger uh, evidence is bipolar disorder. But always remember that uh, uh, another one, another disorder that has stronger evidence for is the PTSD, particularly the anxiety disorders in general or PTSD. And, and the ones that we know is the connection between PTSD and alcohol use disorder. Here, really, a lot of people have PTSD have a tendency to self-medicate with the alcohol use. And um, always also remember, in the case of schizophrenia, that a lot of people have schizophrenia, as you know, they have a tendency to use smoking, they use nicotine as a way to ameliorate a lot of the effects on the attentional deficits that they have. And in fact, you know, a lot of people who have schizophrenia use also the cannabis to be more alert because of a lot of these cognitive effects that happen. The other theory, you know, under the sec secondary substance use disorder model that I want to mention to you very briefly is about what we call the general dysphoria model and theory. And, and that kind of, in a sense, mentions that a lot of people uh, um, usually have a tendency to really uh, use a lot of really the substances uh, to really kind of particularly medicate uh, negative emotional states. What I'm referring to is like, for example, uh, loneliness, boredom, insomnia, uh, physical trauma, and sometimes also uh, really medical illnesses. And uh, what ends up really happening here is uh, the the, 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 the short, when people, the short-term effects of many of the substances have in a way some sort of really can be reinforcing, even though the long-term effects, you know, actually worsen the problem. So a lot of people believe, you know, that if they will use, they're going to get some sort of a relief, is, and which is really, as I'm describing earlier, the self-medication hypothesis here too, is that eventually people want to escape from these negative emotions by using but later on, obviously, these symptoms come back really more intense. The other thing, so that I want to mention under really basically the secondary substance use disorder models is the common factors. There are common factors to both really disorders. You know, you talk about the substance use disorders as well as the psychiatric disorders that explains it. And uh, it's what we're talking about is uh, underlying variable that is independently increases the risk for the both disorders. And and what we talk about these uh, variables, the common factors that I'm talking about are, could be genetic, uh, neurocognitive, familial, social, environmental, I mean, uh, different, different things. The bidirectional models that I'm mentioning in bidirectionality is that when it keeps going back and forth, which means, you know, different factors related to the substance use disorders as well as psychiatric disorders can contribute to the onset of the maintenance of the comorbid disorder, so which means they become too much really 
in the way intertwined here. The other really model, we'll talk about the secondary psychopathology model. What I'm referring to here is that use of substances themselves can precipitate psychiatric disorders or can basically create psychiatric symptoms. And I'm going to give you one typical example. For example, when people use stimulants or cannabis, uh, that could really precipitate psychotic symptoms. But the question has been always, uh, is, should there be like a vulnerability to the person, some sort of a susceptibility? So if they use substances, they're going to end up becoming psychotic, like if they use cannabis? Or like who ends up becoming psychotic after they use cannabis? And we don't, not everybody who smokes cannabis is going to end up having a psychotic break. The same thing, you know, not everybody who's going to be using cocaine. So this is really very much uh, difficult to determine, so which makes it really much more challenging. So anyway, so the question here, so what model, what model really kind of holds here? And interestingly enough, uh, 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 there is no strong support for any specific, one specific model or, or a meta model of comorbidity. Obviously, the combination of all these models could really apply in different settings. So, which means, you know, that uh, 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 the bottom line here is that uh, the comorbidity is extremely high, and we need to keep that in mind, and the theories that we have do not totally explain it. Next slide, Jess, please. So here I want to mention uh, the particularly the, the spectrum of the severity, and it's important because uh, when we see more severe co-occurring disorders in terms of the intensity, the symptoms, usually you see them more when you have psychotic disorder, bipolar disorder, or uh, 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 major depressive disorder. The non-severe usually you see them with some mild anxiety disorders or even adjustment disorders. At the same time, I think this is a little bit of a theoretical classification, so you would want to look at basically each patient and really evaluate where they are in terms of how much impairment and functionality you're seeing as a result of the substance use or the psychiatric disorder, because they could be uh, impaired significantly because of their psychiatric disorder, but not as much because of the substance use and vice versa. Next slide, please. So again, I want to really uh, reiterate what I mentioned earlier about the overrepresented disorder is here, and, uh, and I've already discussed that earlier, but the issue of the misdiagnosing. And, uh, and this has been a big problem because uh, we have sometimes a tendency, and I talked about it earlier, that uh, uh, which, which, which one, uh, uh, which comes first. Uh, unfortunately, in the field of addiction, over the course of the years, past 30, 40 years, there has been a mis, uh, 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 misperception and misconceptualization of the problem is that uh, a lot of people end up going to a rehab programs that are obviously focused on just addiction. They are told that, well, your psychiatric problems and your depression and anxiety are related to the drinking or using, and therefore, if you stop drinking and using, you're not going to have any psychiatric problems. You're going to be all right, and everything is going to be getting better. And interestingly enough, the opposite thing happens in psychiatric settings. When people go to a psychiatric unit and they are treated for their depression, anxiety, and their treatment providers have a tendency to tell them, look, well, since you're really drinking heavily, but now we know if you address your psychiatric disorder, if you treat your depression, you're not going to be drinking much. And it's like in a sense that magically people believe if you treat one disorder, the other disorder is going to disappear or is going to get controlled without any sort of an intervention. And so this is why it is very important to, when it comes to diagnosing co-occurring disorders, we need to be really meticulous about assessing and being clear about identifying if there are the two disorders there, they have to be identified, screened for, and then treated simultaneously. Next slide, please. So here, uh, now we have the context of really what the problem is, you know, the scope of the problem. So uh, next step is how to screen and how to really do the assessments, you know, and uh, there are some uh, tools that can be used, but most importantly, I want to here uh, present you with what needs to be addressed when it comes to screening and assessing and evaluating patients who have co-occurring disorders. First of all, uh, 
I think the whole idea that thinking of assessment as uh, grilling people with questions and because unfortunately in different settings, particularly addiction settings, we have uh, to follow a lot of these uh, regulations, state regulations, county regulations, all the stuff about collecting the data and all the data, like the evaluations are four, five, six, seven, eight pages. That's true. That's important. I'm not saying that we don't want to really get the data and uh, collect the information, but nothing can be accomplished with collecting any data if the patient is not engaged in treatment. We can never bypass the engagement process when it comes to the initial evaluation of somebody of a patient who has a, a substance use problem or psychiatric disorder. And uh, the key issue also with the engagement is that uh, uh, you can really establish that therapeutic alliance within five, ten minutes if you listen at the beginning, allow them to share their story and you're eliciting the story a little bit. And then you can start narrowing it more towards what you want to evaluate the specific areas of evaluations. Always, and I'm going to keep repeating that over and over again, always identifying and engaging the family members and concerned significant others because you might get a different perspective on what the patient is struggling with from their significant others and family members. I'm not saying that you need to do the first assessment by having them sit there with the patient. I think you can involve them for at least 10, 15, 20 minutes of that assessment. We have to always screen and detect the uh, co-occurring disorder as well as whenever we, as I mentioned, we're screening whenever we have somebody who presents with substance use disorder, we need to screen for psychiatric disorders and vice versa. And I'll talk about this determining the quadrant and locus of responsibility. What I'm referring to here, I'll mention it here in the treatment models, is that to evaluate where they are with the severity of really the, uh, the psychiatric disorder and the severity of the substance use disorder. The other thing is that is important, obviously, and then this, as I mentioned it earlier, is that the whole thing about treat, determining level of care. We have the tendency sometimes to want to determine for people what works for them. And let me tell you, when it comes to the patient treatment matching, we have to always believe that we are not going to be matching treatment to people. That doesn't work this way. We have to individualize that treatment and match, basically, the patient to treatment options that they believe would be helpful for them. And I know most of you who work in the addiction field are aware of the ASAM criteria and for placement, you know, and the patient placement criteria and all this. Let's keep in mind, this does not replace common sense. This does not replace also engaging the patient in a conversation because you can get, you can start clashing with the patient and really getting into some confrontation and arg arg argumentation when you really want to tell them that you believe they need to do a certain program, let's say intensive outpatient, but when they tell you, look, but I'm working, I cannot do it, I want to do just individual therapy. So this whole idea that to really try to push some level of care on somebody because we believe is the right thing for them might not, some, most of the time might not work. So we need to work together with the patient to figure out what they believe the best level of care is for them. At the same time, you could also give your perspective and opinion what you think would be potentially, what level of care would be potentially helpful for them. Always remembering when you determine diagnosis is determine the disability, the functional impairment, how much people are impaired because of their disorders. And always, in addition to that, look at people's resources, strengths, as well as their value system. People are going to change because of particular value systems. Always in that context, identifying cultural needs, sociocultural needs, context of communities, and if we want to get really into the treatment, we want to figure out where they are in terms of their motivation for change, their readiness for change. So you want to tailor your interventions based on where they are in terms of the readiness for change. And, and, and this is extremely important. I mean, I know some of you in the field of addiction use trends theoretical model of change to really determine where people are in terms of motivation. At the same time, we can also need to keep in mind that people are not static. People's motivation always changes over the course of treatment, over the course of time, and we want to always be really careful about always evaluating the motivation on a continuum. And always at the bottom of uh, the, 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 the bottom line here, you know, in a sense is also, with whatever you've collected in terms of data and engagement and all this, you want to eventually individualize the treatment plan. Next slide, please, Jess. So now the treatment approaches. How do we, we have two major models that have been looked at in the field and when it comes to treating co-occurring disorder. I'm going to start with the first one. Next slide, please. So this is an example here that I gave about this uh, patient, a 28-year-old uh, 
woman who entered an addiction treatment center when she was assessed as having alcohol use disorder. And six months earlier, she was like, Erin was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and was prescribed an antidepressant by her family doctor. At the treatment facility, the addiction treatment facility, it was recommended that Erin be reassessed and treated, if necessary, at a psychiatric clinic located nearby in town. So what model of treatment does this scenario represent? I would like you to think about that for the people who are familiar with these models there. There's a single model of treatment, sequential model of treatment, parallel model of treatment, integrated model of treatment. I'll define uh, all these models here, but you see here what the situation is. Obviously, uh, Erin has an alcohol use disorder co-occurring with a major depressive disorder. And what really happened is she's now presented at a mental health facility and she was in an addiction treatment center. Then at that time she was diagnosed with alcohol use disorder. Now she presented at a mental health center and, uh, and then expected to receive some treatment. So what is that 3D model of treatment here? So what, what are we doing here? So it looks like to me that all what we're doing is that, okay, let's forget about the alcohol use disorder here and let's just treat the depression. And in fact, this is what we call like a more of single model of treatment because it looks like, you know, in a sense, it's not that we provided any sequential or parallel treatment, it's what we did basically. We kind of decided that now her treatment has to be for uh, basically in a mental health clinic has to be, which is not a dual recovery clinic, again, uh, it's not a clinic where they provide integrated treatment, is that becomes like a more of a single model of treatment. So in fact, you know, ignoring the alcohol use disorder. Next slide, please. So I don't know if you can see the slide, hopefully you can, I don't know this little bit in black here, but the quadrants of care, that is a treatment model that uh, has been really articulated as also, uh, um, you know, different from really the integrated model. You remember I talked about the severity of the psychiatric disorders as well as substance use disorders. It's always important to really keep that in mind. And uh, the reason why this is important because uh, then you would want to tailor the interventions based on that. So what this uh, model has really uh, conceptualized is that uh, you have a psychiatric severity and you have substance use severity. And then you can have different types of uh, patients can fit under either one, two, three, or four. You know, four is basically the high substance use severity and high mental health disorder severities. The, the thing is that uh, that model was basically conceptualized back in 2007, like close to uh, 12 years ago. And the whole theory behind it is that again, based on the severity, we provide three different treatment needs and different treatment settings. And uh, so uh, a lot of uh, treatment addiction treatment programs utilize that model. Next slide, please. So now the question is why integrate a model? What do I mean by integrate a model? What I'm referring to is that integrating, meaning providing a treatment, a simultaneous treatment, of the addiction as well as the concomitant psychiatric disorder. Treating one improves the outcomes in treating the other. And I give you all the reasons here. You know, you remember we talked about the, the prevalence, the high prevalence of the co-occurring disorder. We talk about how the comorbidity affects the course and prognosis of both of them, so they become very intertwined, how people have uh, uh, co-occurring disorders experience poorer outcomes, how people utilize the services much more as well as there is an increased service cost and how the traditional practice, and this is important to keep in mind, this whole traditional practice of really providing what we call parallel or sequential treatment, which means that I will uh, will send you to a mental health treatment program, address your depression there, and and then finish up and then come, come to us as the addiction treatment program and work on your drinking. That is basic sequential or parallel. You send them to do two, two different treatment programs. You send them to a treatment program that addresses their depression uh, or PTSD or whatever, and then you send them to another treatment program where they address their alcohol use disorder or cocaine use disorder. And, 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 and we need to keep in mind that particularly the integrated treatment model when you treat both, what is well known for is that, and the evidence for, is particularly for people who have severe psychiatric disorder. 
severe psychiatric disorder, particularly severe, uh, I'm talking about schizophrenia or severe bipolar disorder, people who have severe psychiatric disorder, they benefit the most from the integrated care. And some of these basically evidence based that we use in these integrated treatment models, uh, this is one of the models that we have in our uh, clinics at the uh, uh, Western Psychiatric Institute of Clinic is a dual recovery model, is uh, we use a lot of the motivation interviewing, we use a lot of relapse prevention, we use dual recovery counseling, all these different aspects. Next slide, please. Let me show you here what we call the three legs stool, and I present it to a lot of my patients when I talk with them about dual recovery. I said, I would say to them, look, uh, just kind of Im imagine yourself to, uh, to be like, to look like a, a three legs stool. Three, there are three basically legs in a three legs stool. So the first leg is about abstinence from alcohols and drugs. The second leg is about adherence to medications, taking medication, whether we're talking about medication assisted treatment or talking about uh, antidepressant, antipsychotic. And the third leg of the stool is the engagement in treatment, doing the therapy, attending also mutual support groups, and also engaging in medical care, because a lot of the patients that we see who have co-occurring disorders might have other medical issues. They might have HIV, hepatitis C. They will need some more of that cool integrated medical care. So imagine if one of these legs is either loose or not there, what would happen to the leg, to the stool? So one leg is loose, one leg is not really present there, the stool is gonna basically collapse. And when the stool is gonna collapse, obviously the, the, the outcome is gonna be more negative. Next slide, please. When we talk about the integrated approach, you know, and this is where I give you some elements of it. What is really done in the integrated approach when we are really working with patients in an integrated approach, we provide integration, which means, you know, we provide the treatment of both conditions. It's comprehensive, thorough. It's a lot of assertiveness, you know, work that is really done basically, you know, and this is reduction. We try to do very, very hard. A lot of it becomes more of a harm reduction, you know, negative, uh, uh, reducing negative consequences. We think of it as a long-term treatment. We don't think about it as just uh, they're going to come for two, three, four months and five months and they are done. So it's a chronic care model. And it's motivationally based. What I'm referring to is that we use the core of the motivation interviewing and the empathic collaborative approach and person-centered approach. And it's based also on people all with their motivation. We accommodate and we tailor the interventions. And most of the time, this model integrates also different therapeutic, psychotherapeutic modalities. I will mention what these modalities could be. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of the integrated models of treatment? A reduced need for coordination. If you're providing it, you know, in fact, the ideal thing is to provide everything uh, 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 at the same place, right, in a dual recovery program. Unfortunately, this might not happen. So how can you provide an integrated care virtually? In a sense, you can still coordinate, uh, make sure that if you have two separate providers, I mean, you could really, if you coordinate, you collaborate, you're really on the same page with the treatment, then you can really get close to an integrated model of care. And uh, patients do not have to really be going to so many places, and uh, uh, they are not going to be frustrated, angry, and or they are not going to have to be very much pressured to really get transportation to different places, and they will establish really, in fact, a therapeutic alliance with the same team. And it would be a lot of shared decision-making responsibilities. And as I mentioned earlier, and I want to continue referring to that, the importance of families, involvement of families, and concerns significant others. And also making sure here that the patients are very much also empowered to really self-manage, and you're going to help them with their recovery at the same time. You want to help them also gain more and more of that autonomy and really figure out what sort of also choices and options they can choose from in treatment. And you present them with these options and really would really with the importance of working with them and helping them feel much more confident and more able to self-manage. And this would really lead to more satisfaction with care. Next slide, please. So here again, the reason why, you know, and I, I've already talked about that, is that why it's important for us to really uh, 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 use an integrated model of care. And, and again, we're not going to debate, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that uh, the causal relationship, obviously when the two exist, they need to be treated simultaneously. Next slide, please. So what are the evidence-based practices we are implementing in the co-occurring uh, treatment of co-occurring disorders? Uh, you know, the, the, the primary one that we use in our clinic 
in our programs, in dual recovery programs, we use the motivation to viewing approach as basically a clinical style as well as basically a therapeutic approach and a lot of adaptations of it, you know, obviously brief interventions, motivation enhancement therapy, CBT, CBT, and we use a lot of the CBT also to relapse prevention and as well as the dual recovery counseling. What I'm referring to is that when you combine the counseling, the CBT, motivation to viewing, as well as for the psychiatric disorders as well as really the substance use disorders. And one model that we use in our clinic, in fact, is the seeking safety model that I want to mention, which is really to address PTSD as well as substance use disorders. We use on an individual level the 12-step facilitation, and we encourage people, obviously, to be involved in 12-step programs, including the Dual Recovery Anonymous, Double Trouble, they call it groups, you know, and programs. Family interventions. Unfortunately, I put a question mark there because a lot of really treatment programs do not provide that work. And this is crucial. And you know, let me tell you, this is very crucial, particularly when we're working with adolescents. Family involvement is crucial and in order to really ensure like positive outcomes. And the other thing that has not been provided much, unfortunately, most of these treatment programs is the behavioral couple therapy, even though it's a very well established uh, uh, treatment program. And, uh, uh, and not treatment program, but I mean treatment modality, I mean, and it has not been really implemented and uh, uh, consistently in treatment programs. The other thing that we do, obviously, pharmacotherapy, is we need to always believe in the fact that medications have to be prescribed and to address and treat the biological components of all these psychiatric disorders, as well as, obviously, as you know, the importance of also combining whether with medication-assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, as well as tobacco use disorder. We're not going to forget when we're integrating treatment here with the co-occurring disorders, tobacco use disorder has to be addressed. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to finish uh, the presentation on this note. When we're talking about recovery in the context of co-occurring disorders, uh, let's kind of not think just disorders. Let's think beyond Think of recovery as something positive beyond the disorder. What I'm talking about is the quality of life, helping people reclaim their lives, helping the people really reestablish connections in their communities, helping people feel more productive. So we're talking about, yes, we want to treat the disorders. At the same time, we want to address patients' needs. We want to work with patients on reestablishing their value system, their goals, their aspirations. And this is extremely important. And I'll tell you when I mention here the closing note of optimism, because a lot of people always ask me, so what are really the outcomes? I mean, do people who have a co-occurring disorder get better? Uh, does treatment work? Well, I'll tell you, there was a study, a 10-year prospective study of clients with severe and persistent mental illnesses and substance use disorders, where they are treated concomitantly. They were treated together. 86% of the, the population that was treated had at least at least one six months remission episode. For those who achieved that at least six months of absence of not using substances, the average duration of the continuous remission was six years. What does that mean? What means that remission from addiction was obviously associated also in that context, in that study, with better outcomes as employment, independent living, life satisfaction, quality of life, and really positive connections in the community. Yes, in fact, also, there was a decrease in substance use and improvement in life functioning. Even, you know, among those people who did not maintain perfect absence after treatment. Uh, I'm going to refer here to a quote by Dr. Bill Miller, who's a big, uh, really, uh, 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 you know, uh, researcher as well as really in the field of addiction, has really transformed the field of addiction with the work that he's done, when he keeps always saying, look, People are not perfect. We are not perfect. When we're thinking about change that people make, we want to embrace any sort of change they make. We might not see all the changes that we want to see, but we want to always remember if we see significant reduction in using, if we see a significant improvement with quality of life, if we see them taking their medications more consistently, we want to be grateful and we want to reinforce that and we want to acknowledge and be really uh, affirm the work that they are doing. Thank you very much.